Christianity puts premium value on the truth. It's at the very heart of the Christian faith. But not everyone is willing to let the Bible speak for itself. At times, you find people who want to make a few tweaks to what Scripture says. They change some things here. They leave other things out there. Today, we're going to talk about four spiritual truths and confront some popular misunderstandings about God and His Word. Hey there, everyone. My name is Dwayne Bryant. It's great to have you tuning in with me today. Uh, if you like this video but haven't subscribed to this channel already, you can hit the subscribe button in your lower right-hand corner and click that bell and you'll get a notification every time I post something new. Well, what is truth? Truth is whatever conforms to fact or reality. It's whatever is really real. The Bible says that the Word of God is truth and that we should be a people of the truth. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, all of this means is that the truth is in us and is lived through us. You and I are people of the truth. We speak it, we serve it, we live it. Now, when we say that we're Christians, we're making a claim to living the kind of life that Christ himself lived. If we don't, then we're nothing more than hypocrites and liars. Well, we're going to talk about four truths that have to be understood in our lives as Christians. First of all, God is both good and just. People in our world have different conceptions of God. Often the kind of God people serve depends on what they want from him. We want stuff or blessings or answered prayers, and so we turn God into a kind of cosmic Santa Claus. Or we want a God who's going to save everybody, and so that's what we turn him into. A God who accepts everyone regardless of what they do, so that hell's going to be virtually empty and heaven will be filled to the brim. We turn him into a God who won't let anyone suffer the consequences of their poor choices. We don't like a just God or an angry God. There's no doubt that God is good and patient. If he wasn't, divine lightning bolts from heaven would be frying people down here every three nanoseconds. Human history would be very short. Well, throughout Scripture, God puts up with insubordination and disobedience from his creation on a constant basis. But in spite of the fact that we disappoint him so often, he still sent his son to save you and me. And in that one act, we have both goodness and justice working together in tandem. God is good, so he's not going to let us doom ourselves without doing anything about it. But he's also just, so we can't just do whatever we want with total impunity. So, we've got a loving God that tells us that the sins we commit still create a debt that has to be paid, but that debt is satisfied at the cross. So God is both good and just. Number two, covenants are binding, but not unbreakable. Covenants were binding legal agreements in the ancient world between two parties. And it's the same for Scripture. We have different kinds of covenant in the Bible. Some of them are unilateral or unconditional, like the ones God makes with Noah, Abraham, or David. God didn't require anything of the other party. There was nothing Noah could do to make God reconsider his promise to never destroy the earth again by flood. Abraham couldn't do anything to jeopardize God's plan to make a nation out of his descendants. And no matter what David did, the Lord would always see to it that one of his descendants would rule on the throne of God's people. Other covenants do have a conditional element. In the Mosaic Covenant, if Israel were to disobey God's covenant commands, they would suffer covenant curses. God makes this very clear and states everything up front. If they violate his commands, they suffer a variety of things. And the big three, as I call them, were plague, famine, and war. But the ultimate and final curse detailed in Deuteronomy 28 is exile from the land. If the Israelites wanted to stay in the land and prosper, they had to follow God's conditions. Well, what about the new covenant? Is it conditional or unconditional? Are we once saved, always saved? Or can we lose our salvation? Well, God makes obedience a condition of the new covenant, which means if we're no longer obedient, then we've broken the covenant and are no longer entitled to receive its blessings and benefits. Hebrews chapters 6 and 10 make it very clear that the covenant is conditional. 
the writer of Hebrews gives dire warnings about remaining faithful. And so the question is, why would he do that unless it was possible to leave the faith, to renounce a commitment to Christ or to commit apostasy? You don't give people warnings unless there's a possibility of danger. Well, contrary to what some of our religious neighbors believe, it is possible to fall away from the faith, just as it was possible for the Israelites to be exiled from the land for worshiping other gods, and just as it was possible for kings to have their dynasties ended if they didn't remain faithful. Well, biblical covenants, including the new covenants, are binding but not unbreakable. The third thing we're talking about today is the fact that salvation is an expensive gift. Now, the idea that salvation is a gift we find in the writings of Paul. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Some Christians have a sense of spiritual entitlement. Now, I've seen it, and maybe you have too, how some people can be given everything, and over time they develop an entitlement mindset. They think the world owes them everything. They think they deserve to be happy. They deserve to never have to go through hard times, and they should never have to know what it means to go without. They want a life of ease, supplied with basic needs without having to work for them. Some people can be like that spiritually. God should give me what I want. God should make me happy. I've been doing God's will, doing things for him, so therefore he's obligated to do something for me in return. The thing is, he isn't. You and I come together every Lord's Day to worship God and thank him for a world of good things he didn't have to create, a gift of grace he didn't have to give, the death of a son he didn't have to send, and the acceptance of enemies that he didn't have to pardon. Now, did you catch that? He didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't. And yet he did. But at what price? You see, the gift of salvation is free to us. The Apostle Paul makes that clear. But it doesn't mean that salvation came with no price tag attached. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, You were bought with a price. This is Paul's reminder to us. Well, that price was the life of God's own Son who loved us, took our place, and redeemed us through his work on the cross, which came at his expense. The fourth thing we're going to talk about here today is the fact that we are traitors who have received pardon. Now, as God's creations, you and I are guilty of what we might call cosmic treason. Now, that term isn't original to me. I first heard it from apologist and theologian R.C. Sproul. But as God's creatures, when we sin against him, it's an act of cosmic rebellion. It's an act of high treason against our creator. Now, it's interesting that the Apostle Paul writes that before Christ came, we were God's enemies. Romans 5.10 says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says something kind of similar to that. In James chapter 4 and verse 4, he says, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Well, any time we side with the world, every time we sin, it's almost like you and I are acting as double agents, claiming allegiance to God, but showing our loyalty to the world instead. You see, we have received pardon. But it has to change us, and we can't take it for granted. It's absolutely vital that we be good students of God's Word. There's a very real sense in which every single one of us is a theologian. So that's why we have to separate fact from fiction and good theology from bad theology. And that means understanding spiritual truths like the four we've talked about today and countless others like them. Well, everyone, hope you're having a wonderful day. Thank you for spending a little bit of it with me. We'll see you next time.